much to Cron Trust and all the partners who are supporting uh, this conversation. I personally really enjoyed uh, the panel, the panel uh, that has just left the stage because as we were discussing that uh, you wake up one morning, you are okay, and you're no longer okay. You know, now you're battling and struggling with a disability that you do not even know how to live with. I think Daisy knows just uh, three weeks ago, and my friends, of course, uh, some of them are the panel. My dad got into a very, very bad accident. You know, one morning you're in an event and you're being called by cops that we've carried a body, it is here. Then the next moment, you're not sure if your father will walk again. And he's still in hospital three weeks down the line. And we're hoping that uh, he'll get better and uh, he'll be able to walk. So I, I could really, really relate with, uh, uh, with the previous panel um, speaking of that. So um, I'll quickly introduce my panel given the time that we are working with. I only have less than an hour, so I hope we can, um, right, an hour? or less, right? An hour or less? Okay, yeah, so between now and two, it's almost two, Daisy. It's almost two. So Susan uh, Wanjiku um, is an entrepreneur, she's an economist, she's an advocate for good governance, and she is the CEO uh, and founder of Strictly Pods, an agro-processing farm. So one of her passions uh, for her home country, Kenya, is uh, she began a YouTube channel called Wanjiku's Eye, and she's going to tell us more about it, where she discusses uh, the link between governance and uh, the social and economic issues in Kenya. And she's committed her skills to creating awareness uh, on human rights and social economic justice and governance uh, issues in this country. And a fun fact about Susan is that she enjoys studying psychology Psychology, uh, especially of criminals and bad leaders, right? So, uh, so I'm actually summarizing the bios. Uh, they'll have a minute to also just elaborate on uh, why they're passionate about what they do. And then we have Mary Ododa. I hope I've pronounced the name uh, well. So Mary Ododa is the chief uh, operations officer at uh, Epuka Ugaidi, and this is a youth-led organization focused on countering uh, violent extremism and uh, terrorism in the Horn of Africa. She's a dedicated peace builder who, uh, who, uh, whose enduring commitment to underserved community serves as a catalyst for positive uh, transformation. And she has over 14 years uh, expertise on project management, uh, operations, research, resource mobilization, and her journey is defined by her unwavering passion. Uh, for sustainable development and uh, peace building. And her strategic insights and innovative approaches have facilitated successful uh, implementation of impactful initiatives aimed out count at, at countering violent extremism. And she's going to share more uh, on that or, uh, on the panel. Then we have uh, Francis Iganga. And Francis is the founder and director at Consulting Farm Research Dimension Services. His key areas of expertise include research, strategic planning, project monitoring, and uh, evaluation. Uh, he's worked with the civil society movement since 2005 to 2014 as a senior program manager. And uh, his best contribution was Kenya Women's Manifesto, 2006. 2007, right? And an article titled Plus 21 Critical Landmarks for Women's Challenges and Breakthroughs in March 2008. So you can see we are still in the struggle, right? We are still in the struggle. And he's authored several articles, including Gender Agenda. And last but not least is uh, Wilkista Aduma. She's a, you know, she's a passion-driven champion for democracy and uh, good governance. And uh, this has enabled her to become a thought leader in this area. She's currently engaged as a strategy associate at uh, Miale Public Affairs and as the Partnerships Resource Mobilization Lead at IBC Youth Coordinating Committee uh, on a part-time basis. And she's the founder uh, of an initiative called Run for Office, which champions political development with a focus on creating a value chain to increase levels of engagement in political and democratic processes. She has over six years experience in political party administration, movement building, and consortium building. Please help me appreciate my panel.
So thank you so much uh, for creating time to be here and for this platform. And I think just to set context, even as we talk about um, intergenerational mentorship. And I love sharing uh, data and statistics because they say numbers don't lie and it's it's important to look at where we are at. Uh, if we just span in just this last election, right, um, you know, we didn't even have enough women run for office. And you can imagine we're talking about enough women, how much more um, those living with disabilities, right? How much more? If we don't even have just us ordinary women uh, running for political office, because we're talking about 16,000 candidates who are on the ballot in 2022. 16,000. And only approximately 2,000 were women on the ballot. And we can see there's no way we would have met the two-thirds gender rule given those numbers. But then when we talk about young women, and if we look at um, their electability, we only have 20 young women who are elected in uh, 2023 when it comes to the general election. So I think for me, when it comes to this conversation, it's very important, and I think even as we talk about intergenerational mentorship, we also need to start having broader conversations when it comes to intergenerational core leadership. How do we lead together, you know? Because that's where the challenge is. And we were just uh, chatting with uh, Hannah over, uh, over tea break. And uh, you know, she made a remark and we're discussing how for the first time we have five generations in our offices, like five, from the baby boomers to Generation Z. So you can imagine even those scales, because in the past, we're talking about, oh, you know, majority are millennials, majority are baby boomers, but currently, you're in an office with all, you know, all the generations, like five of them, and everyone, um, has a right in terms of, oh, I think this is what we need to do. The Gen Z's are coming in, they're saying, Apana, I think we need to lead this way. So I think it's a very important conversation. So I'll start with uh, uh, Mary Ododa. Um, so you can share a little bit about uh, your passion in terms of the area you've chosen when it comes to violent um, extremism. And we know how indigenous knowledge, you know, shapes our community, the value it brings. So when you, t when you think about intergenerational um, mentorship and uh, conversation, how has, the, how has this helped preserve and pass down the knowledge to younger gener generations, especially when it comes to countering violent extremism and uh, enhancing peace in our communities. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And, <laughs> and thank you so much for this um, opportunity. One, um, so to start off, one thing that I would like to say is that when it comes to our programming and the work that we do, information is king and, and localization is key. We cannot start any program without first understanding what is happening on the ground. And this is where indigenous knowledge comes in. So for instance, before we begin a project, we have to go to the ground, find out what the root causes are, because um, as we're designing a program, we need to know how will this impact the community. We just don't want to go in and get out, just for us to be able to tick boxes at the end of the year to our donors and just say, this is what we have been able to achieve. Um, so having knowledge that is rooted in tradition, in value, values um, and in culture pertaining to a particular um, community enables us to be able to define how we can be able to assist women especially. So at Chapuka we have three different um, program um, areas. So we have for youth, for women and for children. And I think for the purpose of this discussion I will focus on the, um, on the, the programs that we have for youth and for women. Um, for instance, I think if I give an example then um, it's going to put this into context. Um, in terms of CVE, we also work in the governance space. At the moment, we have a project in Baringo on disarmament, disintegration, and reintegration. We all know the issues that are going on at the moment, and conflict has a gendered aspect to it. And the only way we can be able to address this is when we go to the ground and actually speak to the women and, and get to understand how does this conflict affect you. And from there, we then create a safe space whereby the older generation and the younger generation have an open dialogue. 
it can be a challenge because in some in some cultures, young people are not even supposed to sit with the older generation. And um, in some spaces, as a woman, I also cannot sit with the leaders of a community. So all these are obstacles and challenges that um, will not go away overnight, but so long as we keep having a look at what the root um, causes are, learning what a community needs, having that indigenous knowledge and to be able to create a safe space, that way we can be able to carry out mentorship and ongoing conversation to be able to address governance, peace, and security, and to make sure that all these different generations, that there's, a, there are, that there's an ongoing conversation in order to reduce um, recruitment and enhance peace and cohesion in communities. Uh, just staying on that, because um, you're talking about us understanding the context, you're talking about uh, creating safe spaces. And uh, in bridging uh, this divide, we have to find a common ground. So how do we find this common ground? And maybe can you share a success story on how you've been able to achieve this uh, when it comes to your own initiative, or perhaps something you've observed? Yes, um, so some of the avenues that we use in order to reach out to communities, we use um, non-traditional methods such as um, sports, we use creative arts, um, we design comic books, um, just the usage of tech. And what we do, um, so for instance, creative arts cuts across. This is a language that the older generation and the younger generation can be able to engage in, be it music, be it um, poetry, be it creative a space whereby you can be uh, you can use arts to try and explain what the issues are and from this we've actually been able to see how the older generation perceives conflict because Conflict has always been there, and conflict resolution um, mechanisms have been there. It's just that at times, as the younger generation, we tend to think we have way better ideas. So if we can be able to merge traditional um, conflict resolution mechanisms and contemporary ones, using the current resources that we have right now, that way we have been able to create spaces that um, has been successful in a way that now the younger generation, we can sit and listen and actually understand this problem has been here just in a different era, but this is how now we can be able to solve it using the current resources that we have. Uh, thank you. Susan, I want to bring you in because Mary is talking about, you know, merging traditional and contemporary methods, right? And uh, reverse mentorship, the conversation about reverse mentorship has been gaining traction, right? And uh, we're discussing now that mentorship is just not vertical. It can also be horizontal, because even some of us learn from our own children who are way younger, and some of them even in primary school, but they teach us something. How, um, how can you speak more about this dynamic, but then even as young women, how can we contribute perspectives and insights to enrich, um, um, you know, like to enrich the older generation's um, conversations and uh, insights about mentorship? Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm Susan Wanjiko. I'm the founder of Wanjiko's I and um, I have a YouTube channel that's called One She Calls I, where I break down um, how our governance in Kenya spills down into our social and economic issues. Um, so that's my channel. In fact, uh, 30 seconds for everyone to get onto YouTube and search for one Jiko's eye and subscribe. Um, and one thing has really been brought out uh, from the conversations that we've been having is that women do not have um, knowledge and information on the things that can help them advance, um, whether it's in uh, investments, business, uh, political leadership, women are lacking in the knowledge. And even when I look at my own statistics of my audience, over 90% of those people are men. So please get onto YouTube and subscribe as I speak. Um, now, on to reverse mentorship. I don't really think it's a new thing. I think it's the name that is new. Because as I was listening to the stories of the women who spoke yesterday and the ladies who've gone before us, um, Sophia, uh, 
yeah, Sophia Abdinur, her story was very inspiring, Daisy Elachi, all of them began when they were young. So it's not that reverse mentorship is now starting to gain traction, it's just that now it's being given a name. And because they started when they were young, that means that there were old people of that time who were opposing them and making sure that they couldn't break into women in leadership, whether it was out of tradition or culture or just attitudes and beliefs, or just men feeling like we can't compete with women, they have no place, um, or just feeling threatened by the fact that women can actually um, take over that space. So reverse, reverse mentorship actually has been um, in existence. Um, and there always has to be someone who is willing to make that sacrifice. Um, as we heard of the stories yesterday, uh, Sophia saying, I, I really enjoyed her story, her, her saying that she had children running around, running around her, um, I think with, <laughs> Yeah, with the Sufuria saying she's a mad woman, and then even uh, her students refusing for a woman to teach them because they were the men. So you have to be very ready to break, um, to just go against the grain, um, and, it, and it's going to be a sacrifice. So how has it been beneficial? Number one, you challenge um, stereotypes and norms and attitudes that are no longer beneficial to anyone. For example, who said that women should not own land or they cannot own land? Or who said Nani aliandika mahali na kwa nini aliandika that after a woman's husband dies, she must be inherited? So we have to have people asking those questions and be sure it will be met with resistance. So it's been beneficial because at the end of the day, no matter how long the fight, um, even for example, the two thirds gender rule that we keep speaking about over here, we've not yet achieved it, but we've definitely made uh, progress uh, with the number of women getting into leadership positions. Um, and we also have more women being supportive of other women, because we know even we women sometimes don't support um, our own. Number two, another way that it's been beneficial is the younger generations, um, the younger millennials and Gen Z especially, are breaking down something that, in my opinion, um, has contributed to Kenya's downfall for us to get into where we've reached, and that is something called power distance. Now, power distance is where we feel, just because that someone has the power, kwa sababu anaitua mheshimiwa, no offense to the waheshimiwas, kwa sababu anaitua your honorable, they should not be asked questions. And um, just to reference an incident that happened recently, there was in Gishu scholarship scandal. Um, there was a young lady, her name was Masi. She was trending for calling out the county government of was in Gishu for stealing funds that would have taken them away from the problems of this country. But funny thing is, um, as she was trending, I was observing the looking at the comments and the engagement. And we had the people who were celebrating her and applauding her and saying, you know what, we've had enough of, of this corruption and people stealing our funds. But there's another section of uh, social media that was saying, um, that is disrespectful. And I was just looking at that, that response and I was like, guy, Kenyans are mjachoka kudanganywa. Like, I, I was so shocked. And then um, later on, I saw a senator offering her a job, and once again, she declined, and she said, if you really want to solve the problems of this country, go to the Senate and make sure the people of Wasimgishu get their money back. And we had a section of social media once again saying, celebrating her. And another section of social media also saying, um, Chukua hiyo pesa. We solved mashida zako, wacha wengine wapambane na mashida zao. You see, so it takes a certain kind of boldness to break um, power distance, seeing that mheshimiwa haizi ulizwa swali yoyote kwa sababu 
yeye ni mheshimiwa and me i normally say on my channel i have a whole series called the real mheshimiwa i say that we are the real waheshimiwas and the people who liberated this country did it while they were young they gave up their lives and it's up to the younger generation to carry on that legacy that our great grandparents and great grandparents and grandparents in some other situations um, really fought for us to have all the rights that we enjoy today, both human rights, both democratic rights, the women's rights, all those who are fought for, and they have to be carried on by the younger generation. So power is not given, power is taken. And mm. if the young people don't engage, and the older people who have really fought to get where we are work, if they don't work with the younger generations, then I'm, I feel like we will really go back on what we have gained so far. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, I love that you're saying that what is new is uh, just the name, and this has always been there. And I uh, thank you so much for uh, highlighting uh, Mercy, because when I was thinking about Mercy and when people were celebrating Mercy, Mercy reminds me of women like Chela Gatmutai. I feel like if Chela Gatmutai was in this generation, she'd be trending every day, because you are elected at 24, not nominated elected at 24 in the Moi regime, and you speak truth to power without saying uyu ni mtuetu, siezi ongea. You know, because we have that thing that is eating us, where we are feeling like, if I'm elected under this party, I cannot speak because this is my person, you know, I have to, uh, you know, I have to be loyal, you know. I feel like if Chelagat existed in this generation, and she's a huge inspiration, you know, to think about political persecution, and still, even the challenges we discuss as young women, oh, I went to the community, they told me I was not married, I went there, they told me I don't have children. She was not married. She didn't have children, and she was elected at 24. So I think it's to celebrate those who've gone before us. And speaking of that, Susan, just still on that, when it comes to this, you know, movement buildings and uh, the effort we are putting in as civil society. So how do we keep these movements vibrant? Because if we are saying this has always existed, the mentorship has always existed, so how do we keep these movements vibrant from your standpoint? Okay. Um, so for starters, just so that um, I give context to what I'll explain, um, the older generations, what we know they bring. Um, they have the social networks, they have the social capital, which they've built over time. Like yesterday, we were told if you want to fundraise um, or to be put into a political party, and Derito said she could help you, Daisy can help you with the fundraising. So the older generations really bring the social network, the social capital, the knowledge, the experience, the history, and the institutional memory. Like for me yesterday, I really learned um, about the journey it took to get to um, the two-thirds gender rule getting to the constitution. You see, that is something that I didn't know. And now the newer generations, um, they're mostly associated with technology, but they also bring new insights, new ideas, um, a lot of energy, and different ideology. Um, and the ideology is really is questioning um, why are things the way they are, and why have they been allowed to exist the way they are existing, even though they are not beneficial. So that's something the new generation um, uh, brings about. So for them to, for the mentorship initiatives to remain vibrant, one thing that um, can really help with this is collaboration and not competition. It's not the younger people against the older people. Mm -hmm. They complement each other, and that's based on what I've said, um, the, what the new generation has to bring and what the older generation has to bring. So it's really um, working to connect, uh, working to together and connecting them to the people who will push the agenda even further. And that also brings me to my next point. We cannot have gatekeeping in these issues. So what I mean by gatekeeping is, um, let's say, 
someone has access to resources or information or knowledge that could help push an agenda forward, but they choose not to share that knowledge and information just because they feel that um, if I do share this, it's going to be a threat to my own relevance. So for example, um, this has not happened. Uh, let me use Daisy and myself. So let's say um, I am interested in championing the two thirds, which is really associated with Daisy in this country. Um, and then I approach her and tell her that, you know what, I'm really interested in this. Um, can we do something together? Um, can we con could you connect me to the resources that would help me build onto what you've already done? And Susan, uh, Daisy will look at Susan and say, this girl is a threat to my own relevance. She might take attention from myself. So if I allow her into that space and connect her with all the people I know who can push this agenda forward, she'll make me relevant and she'll take my spot. And that is what is gatekeeping. So gatekeeping will not help in um, ma making sure that the mentorship initiatives remain vibrant. Um, because it makes the agenda become personalized. So if it's two-thirds agenda, it's about DAISY, and it's not about the benefit of Kenya. It's not for the good and common good of Kenya. So that is what I mean by um, personalizing an agenda to make sure that it just benefits me and benefits me alone. If I make that noise, Yes, people will have some benefits here and there, but the legacy does not go on beyond me. So that is what I mean. Um, that is one of the things I see that can hinder the um, making sure that mentorship initiatives remain vibrant and get keeping in the governance space is very real. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we're going to uh, expound more on that. Well, Kista, I want to invite you in. You know, when it comes to run for office, you're quite passionate about um, especially young people occupying um, office when it comes to politics, right? What are some of these um, obstacles that especially young women need um, to overcome? And what guidance um, are they seeking? But more importantly, how can we ensure that young women's voices are heard in such a traditionally male-dominated space? All right. So um, before I start, any hands of someone who considers themselves a Gen Z in the room? Gen Z. Gen Z. Generation Z. Gen Z. They were born from the year 2000. I work with them, so I know they were born from the year 2000. Gen Z, can I hear a who? who? <laughs> Hands of people who consider themselves millennials in the room. Okay. Millennials. Mlizaliwa between 1980 to, to no no millennials are th between uh, 39 to 25. Or between yeah. F yeah, between 39 yeah. to 25. So yeah. it's 81 to 96. Yeah. 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 Eh? Eh? Uh, no, Daisy, no, 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 no. Daisy is asking a question. Actually, if you go that direction, does it mean when Guinea wa Kongwe? She's asking a question. <laughs> she, she's like, where Everyone. it is headed? Where it is headed, those definitions? <laughs> Everyone fits somewhere. Hands of people who consider themselves baby boomers in the room. Baby boomers. Before 1981. <laughs> 19, 1946, 1964. Yeah, if you are born between 1946 to 1964, baby boomer. And then there's Generation X. Come out, Gen Z, Millennial. <laughs> And then I believe the silent generation is not in the room because they were way before baby boomers. <laughs> so the reason, <laughs> the reason I highlight the different generations is 
we have to be conscious of the seasons and generations in our lives. So when we are talking about uh, mentorship, cross-generational mentorship, we are conscious about all these tiers of generations in our lives. And at Run for Office, um, as you mentioned, young women face a lot of challenges in terms of getting their voices heard out there. And some of these challenges are no different from what uh, baby boomers experienced when they were getting into this space. It's no different from what uh, the silent generation experienced when they were getting into the space. It's no different from what the millennials are facing uh, when they're trying to get into the space. And it certainly won't be different for Gen Z. Unless, of course, we do something to shift that. And one of the major challenges of young women in politics, and I want to spotlight young women who ran in the last election. If you ran in the last election, please rise. If you are a young woman who ran in the last election, please rise. Wow. Yeah, let's, uh, let's give them a better round of applause. the young women who ran. <laughs> please have a seat where Shimiwa. <laughs> in waiting or standing or sitting, please have a seat. One of the major issues that young women experienced in the last election, particularly regarding mentorship, is a lot of the mentorship happened between age mates or people from the same generation. For example, um, Wanjiku Tiga in waiting, or <laughs> Shimiwa in waiting uh, for Kiambu County Assembly, uh, we had a lot of exchanges, right? And that goes for a lot of different other young women who reign. What am I saying? Peer mentorship is taking center stage as opposed to this cross-generational exchange that we need to have. It is a lot more common for myself and my friend to learn from each other than from myself, a millennial, to learn from a baby boomer in the political space specifically, and I am yet to understand why that is so. And it is not, and I want to demystify that women are their own enemies, they are not. 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 I am here because of a woman, and my journey starts with a woman. The next one connects with a woman, and a woman and a woman to this place I am seated right now. I sound the way I do because there are women who told me, before you sit on a panel, you really have to do your research. You can't not sound like you don't know your craft. So it was a woman. So let me demystify. If it hasn't happened for you, gravitate towards that happening for you. That women open doors that have been shut for you, all right? And for me, my plea, and particularly for women in politics, is a want for us to open the space where we have this cross-generational exchange. We cannot have very wise women who are winning elective seats at 24 in a time and period where patriarchy reigned more than it does now. Yeah. And then we don't have a trickle down of that wisdom. We can't have the likes of, um, you know, Phoebe Asio leading the way they did, representing women in spaces where platforms that were dominated by men. And then in my generation, we don't have that. We cannot have in this generation very, very smart, brilliant women. And then in the generation of Gen, Gen Z, um, we don't have that. So there's a gap of creating that linkage in terms of cross-generational uh, mentorship, particularly in the space for women in politics. So I feel that is what we need to create. So if you don't have in your circle, and there's Gen Alpha, hello. They are not in the room, but they are coming. They are coming. Yeah. <laughs> Gen Alpha, they are coming. Yeah, they are coming. All right, they are coming. <laughs> so if you don't have in your circle a Gen Alpha, a Gen Z, a millennial, a baby boomer, and perhaps Gen X, 
then you're missing out something very important. You're missing out, Kabisa. So if you walk out of this room, if you don't have one of those people in your life, please consider bugging a person from this room. And I know very brilliant ones in this room, particularly. Mm -hmm. I can spotlight Salian. Salian wave. Salian is 19. She's brilliant. She's, she's just started a YouTube channel where she's spotlighting women who are doing amazing things. Can someone hold Salian's hand? OK. Can, can she get people for her show here for the whole year? <laughs> for, I mean, Sally, Sally, get up. OK. Yeah, she should get an entire year of content from this room. She shouldn't have to struggle to look for a baby boomer, a Gen X, a millennial, a woman who's doing amazing. And I'm seeing all these amazing women. And by the way, I'm going home to say that um, a honorable mm -hmm. county woman member of National Assembly from Homer Base, and I sat on the same chair today. <laughs> 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 okay, we'll there are amazing start. women in this room. So I feel like if you don't have that that kind of list, ile zebra tunapenda kusema ya ABC, wewe kwa life yako kuwa na hiyo zebra list. Wilkista, um, you know, when you introduce Generation Z and um, Alpha and Millennials, majority of them were born, you know, are digital natives. They were born in this uh, era of uh, technology. And uh, we are seeing how technology is becoming an integral tool when it comes to communicating. Right. How can we leverage technology um, when it comes to mentorship? You know, because I'm pretty sure, perhaps, I don't know, how many of us here are even on TikTok? Wangapi wako TikTok hapa? You know, meza siko TikTok. Kuna wana ata imeza wako TikTok? You know, ata, you know, ata, imeza wako, Daisy, you know, Daisy, your table kwa no watu wako TikTok. You know, I'm not on TikTok, yeah. But we are seeing, you know, even right now, I think we're talking about TikTok, uh, the ban, uh, the ban on TikTok. Um, so how can we embrace technology as a tool for mentorship across these different generations that we are talking about right now? Right. Um... Technology could be used in a lot of different ways. But one to start by, if you don't understand technology, mm -hmm. create opportunity for someone else who does. OK. All right? Mm -hmm. And most probably, they're going to be a younger person. Mm -hmm. Most probably, they're going to be a younger person. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we also need to tap into is structured mentorship. Mm -hmm. So structured mentorship is where we can use uh, tools technological tools to make it happen. Mm. I don't have to meet um, Rahab, for example, mm. for her to mentor me. Mm. There are platforms that can be created in a way that I can learn from her without having to meet her mm. in mm. person. Mm. And I can refer to her as my mentor without particularly having to meet her. Mm. Each one of us in this room, I'm sure, has a person that they follow ardently on social media, whether it's on YouTube, um, whether it's on TikTok, Everyone has someone that this is my person. Like, I have to listen to this person. I have to tap into their wisdom. Mm -hmm. I feel like there are platforms that we need to build like those to create these kind of linkages. And it can help bridge the gap that we are speaking about in terms of cross-generational mentorship. You don't have to be in the same place as me. I don't have to meet you in the same room. I don't have to breathe the same air with you for you to share your wisdom and knowledge. And for me, I think my call was very clear that we can't see wisdom in one generation and see it lacking in the next and sit comfortably with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for that. You know, Francis, you've been sitting here uh, on the panel, and I think uh, listening to all the rich insights uh, and conversations on a panel, as the only male panelist, uh, what do you see as your role, you know, in fueling this intergenerational mentorship um, for women empowerment? You know, what are some of the insights and perspectives? I think when I was reading your bio, you know, the work that you've done across very many years uh, in civil society, what are some of these insights and perspectives, you know, do we need to, you know, hone in on, you know, to ensure that we have effective strategies when it comes to intergenerational mentorship, especially for women empowerment? Thank you very much, and very good afternoon, everyone. Let me read for you some names. Mm -hmm. You know Mata Karua? Mm -hmm. You know Rab? Mm -hmm. 
You know Madam Charity Ngilu? Yes. You know Mama Nyiva Mwendwa? Mm -hmm. You know Mama Sally Kosge? Mm -hmm. You all know Mama Aido Dinga? Mm -hmm. You all know Mama Phoebe Asio? Mm -hmm. You know she was here, Sophie Abdi? Mm -hmm. uh, you know Madam Deborah Kumu? Mm -hmm. uh, Julio Jambo, Dr. Uh, of course, uh, Madam Dr. Baraza was here. Professor, oh yeah, thank you. And uh, yes, yes, she's there. And uh, Professor Kabira was here. Many of you know Rosemary Okello. Let me stop there. When I came in the movement 27 years ago, those are the people who mentored me to be who I am, to be a gender activist to be analytical about gender issues. They mentored me. Whom did I mentor? April of 2007, Cynthia, we were in this hall. We were actually training women, leaders. And I'll name them. Miss Yujuma, you know her? Do you know she could not speak on this particular kind of forum? Am I lying? But today, she's a firebrand. She speaks with authority, with power, with high esteem. Of course, Emilio Diambo, you know, she was in the civil society. When we were being told with Willy Luguza, who was the OCPD in Nairobi during the Sexual Offenses Act, to Kalalisho Kualami, Hapo Jogo House, we could not go to parliament. Uh, you know Rosa Buyu, you know Rachel Shabesh, I can name the list. Those are the people whom the women's movement took over and many more and moved with them. Today they're in leadership. From 2007, they came to leadership in 2013. My point is cross-cultural counseling is possible. But what are the problems? But before I talk to the problems, days we went to Kericho to do what we call a governor's round table. Professor Chepkoni brought a lady who was a third year in Moi University. She came driving a double cabin, Toyota Hilux, new brand. She had been given a contract by the county government of Kericho. Professor Chepkoni brought two ladies. Anyone who was in Kericho will testify. Who had been given a contract to build a road from Kericho to Majani, who Nandi Hills, towards Nandi Hills. They came driving. Let me go to the people I knew. You knew the late Lona Laboso. Then we knew the late Dr. Joyce Laboso, the sister. Then we know today of Toto. We are talking about Bomet County, right? If you go to Central, of course, you'll get many leaders who have been appointed to leadership. What I'm trying to say is this. The support system is at three levels. Either women will be supported by the community, like the ones I've mentioned whom have been voted to leadership, the community support. Some will actually be supported by government because of the policy and the goodwill of the government of the day. The others are self-made. Let me just look at the challenges. You are saying before we talk about um, what needs to be done. If we don't understand the context, and my sisters have spoken so well, if you don't understand the context within which to address youth issues, or even to understand them, then that is a problem. The second problem is politicizing the youth. You can think in your own way how we have politicized youth in this country. Think about it in your own way. And the third thing is the lack of political goodwill. For example, my sister here, there spoke. If you are a serious leader, you would have sat here to listen to women's issue, to understand them, so that when you make a policy, you understand what the women are thinking, what the, 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 their plans are, or what the challenges they are facing. But that is, that is the disconnect, because our theme is intergenerational uh, mentorship and, and, of course, the disconnect. And that is the disconnect. Another disconnect. We have very good policies in the country, very good on paper. Implementation is the biggest challenge of Kenya. In any sector you think of, 
And when you think about the context, I was talking about context. Where's Vision 2030? Seven years to go down the line? What have we done about youth? How about our youth policy? Is it inclusive? Is it responsive? You know, you look at that policy, and even when you go to the constitution at code 260, where it defines a youth as someone 18 to 34, I'll tell you the problem. The problem is that is a very short term um, um, season. My sister spoke about season because it takes you 14 years to shift from being a youth to being to being a what? Generation yes. <laughs> so you can imagine you are dealing with issues that span 14 years alone because past that time that person is no longer a youth. So the other challenge, of course, is uh, the challenge of approaches that we use to address the issues of young people. For example, we've spoken about Agbo since yesterday, right? Do we have an incubation model where if you go to WEF, to WESO, or to Hustler Fund, there is a system where you will be trained before you get money. They will walk with you the journey until you break even in your business, then they say, hallelujah, move on, we pick the next cohort. Another challenge is a challenge of principles of engagement with the young people. Do we value them? My sister spoke about value. Do we want to build self-esteem in them? So if the principles of engagement are not aligned, they are not meant for justice. For example, to Nasema, uh, 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 when we are referring to young people, they are not knowledgeable, they are not experienced. What language is that that we are using? So that defines the approaches that we are using. So another issue is the issue of experience, good or bad, negative or positive. And those, those are the things that we need to look at that will help us, for example, build a knowledge-based society. We say young people are very tech savvy, but what are they doing on the social media? Mm. Socialites? Or looking for knowledge? Searching for information about Rahab to understand her journey, to understand her challenges, looking at uh, um, Crown Trust videos to see the journey of women? They have spoken about it, but what are you looking for on social media? So there are many, including our perceptions and so forth and so forth. Mm -hmm. Just maybe a quick one is for me, we need to invest in young people in several areas. Market skills. We have East African community. We have free movement of people. We are now seeing the president, the former president, the current president. They are reaching out to other countries where we can export labor. How are we using that? She's at the cross border, Cynthia. You do a lot of business across the border. How many young people are doing it, or are only your generation? We need to do a proper, and I've spoken today, we've start, struggled with this thing for since 2017, to put in place a program that, for example, the last election with Elisha to pop, we should have picked the next level of women, started training them, started moving with them. By the time, remember there are now how many years remaining? Four. So the first year has gone. So say three years, to be specific, because the other election is the election year. We need to train our women in entrepreneurship skills, a key area of economic empowerment. And Daisy has been also working around that, and many other organizations, and I've heard this morning an organization that says we can, we do investment. Mm -hmm. So another issue is about the institutions that we have. Um, we have a problem. When you talk about institutions, then we'll get what we call administrative hurdles, like Akbo Nambua, you from CR, someone mentioned here yesterday. Yes. Yeah? You are told, Nancy, you spoke about it. Now, there's a very big challenge in the room called a, ta a tax compliance certificate. Mm -hmm. That thing is killing women entrepreneurship. And you see, it's an administrative hurdle. You are not supposed to be denied an opportunity to do business to generate money because you've not refused to pay tax. But they are holding you back so that you don't get business. They make you a criminal in the system because you'll default. That is the kind of administrative issues we are talking about in terms of that. So collaboration, my sister has spoken about. But then peer review. From yesterday when you came here, how many women have you reached out to get their numbers? 
like to just say, Rahab, I've called you. I would like to have a cup of coffee with you, maybe in your house or in town. Mm. Mentorship. How many of your peers, mm -hmm. even at organization level, have you reached out and picked their numbers in this forum since yesterday mm -hmm. to say, I need to, with the, or daughter here, I have to network with her. And lastly, referrals. Mm -hmm. Okay? Referrals, references, guarantees. How, how do we do it? Maybe before, because of time, uh, mm -hmm. National Women's Theory Committee mm -hmm. does its work very well. Creating networking, creating links, training women to develop their skills and knowledge base. Uh, it does a lot of exposure. Right? You've come from one county to another county. You, tomorrow you'll be training maybe in Kisumu. Mm -hmm. That exposure, learning from, and I said, I started by cross-cultural counseling is possible. Mm -hmm. Don't just stay in Nyeri. Go to Nyanza and know what people in Nyanza are doing. Mm -hmm. Go to Taita, see what people are doing there. Yes. And you will learn. Lastly, mm -hmm. it's about women themselves. The young people mm -hmm. must create a voice and a platform for themselves like you have done. That's true. That's true. Thank you so much. Please help me ap appreciate all the insights that are coming uh, from my panel. Great. Uh, thank you so, 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 so much. Like, I've just been writing and writing uh, and writing. Susan, thank you so much for your insights uh, on going against the grain, on uh, challenging stereotypes that are not beneficial to our struggles. And uh, uh, Will Kista, uh, thank you so much. We have to open the channels for, you know, cross, uh, uh, for, uh, for cross uh, mentorship and ensure that the wisdom that we're talking about is actually uh, trickling down. Uh, Mary, we have to understand the context within which we are programming and, um, uh, and having this conversation. I think uh, Francis, again, uh, emphasizing on us understanding the context and not politicizing the women issue and the youth, um, you know, and the youth issue, but also even for the leaders who are uh, sitting in uh, positions of power, understanding the women's issues enough to be able to create policies uh, that uh, support that. And of course, when it comes to referrals, I'm sure here we can always refer each other. You know, you don't have to be seated at a very higher position of power to be able to refer someone. And I think my challenge uh, on that is in the afternoon, you know, just find out what someone else is doing because you know someone who can actually benefit uh, their cause if they can't work directly with you or if you cannot support uh, their cause. I think that's that uh, for our short and sweet uh, panel. Thank you so much for being part of this and enriching these conversations. Asante Nisana. Makofi, Makofi, uh, Bina and her panel. Thank you very much, uh, Bina, for that and also for your willingness uh, to defer the plenary session. Uh, let me call up uh, Daisy Amdani for less than five minutes. She just wants to make known to us uh, the resources available, including the Women's Voice and Leadership Resource Center. One of the things that they've talked about is uh, being able to find out what who is doing. And at Crown Trust, one of the things that we do very well is networking and alliance building. And under the Women's Voice and Leadership uh, Project, we have a gender resource center. This gender resource center is a directory. Dennis, is Dennis there? Uh, yes, here it is. So this is a resource center and it's a directory. And it's a directory of women's rights organizations mapped across the country. You can search by county, you can search thematic areas. So this gives visibility to work that is being done. So like honorable members in the room, if you want to search your county or constituency and see which women groups are there, because we have already mapped, I think we have, we have over a thousand organizations mapped from all the 47 counties, the, the, um, we have, yes, 1,222 organizations. These are women's rights organizations. And you can, you can search. You can search by name. You can search by county. You can search by theme. So you are able to know who is doing what around you. Now, if there are women rights organizations here and you search on the net and your organization is not there, you can see Dennis at the back and Winnie, 
who can uh, take your details so that you can be included. Because this is a resource where even donors go to see what organizations are doing. Because there's so much focus on Nairobi so that sometimes even the grassroots organizations don't get visibility. So through this uh, 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 directory, you can get visibility. People can know what you are doing. We also have citizen journalists that work within the regions and collect information of work that is being done by women rights organizations across the country. And we post the stories of those, what you are doing. So like if you have an initiative that is happening, we can post it for you so you get visibility. Because sometimes um, organizations don't have resources to advertise their work. So we advertise for you for free so that you, you, are, you are able to, people are able to know what you're doing. So it's a really good resource. Um, it has a directory of activities that are going on. So make use of it. It is there for all of us to be able to use. And so you can get to know what others are doing. Uh, when there are grants that are, uh, are available, we also post there so that you can know where resources are, uh, the calls for proposals and all, because under the WVL, we have uh, organizations that are grant makers. They give money to organize, so they do calls for proposals. So you'll be able to see if you, you are able to reach out for that. So please. Uh, www.wvlkenya.org, that is the website. And if you know you are not mapped on it, please see Winfred and Dennis, and they'll make sure that your organization, but of course it is women-led organizations or a women's rights organization. Your work focuses on women's issues, women and girls' issues. Those are the ones. It's a directory for issues around uh, women. Thank you. Woman, woman, yeah, I'm a super woman, woman.